With that being said, we're going to move on to our sermon for the day. Um, and we're going to change things up a little bit. By the way, Lloyd is gone on a vacation uh, celebrating a wedding in Nebraska. So... Uh, with Hazel, and I think it's her first time ever flying, so that's a fun experience for them. Um, And he should be back sometime pretty soon, I think. Uh, But he is very invested in Daniel, which, I mean, there's a lot to be invested in there, right? So we're going to take a break and look at Psalm 42 today. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to pull that out. If you do not have one, there should be one in the seat ahead of you. If you are using that Bible like I am, the page is on 560, right? try to make it easy on you guys. Um, And we're going to be talking about something a little different than you guys might expect. All growing up, uh, my dad, he's a pastor. He's been uh, in churches for a long time. I think his current church, he's been there for 17 or 18 years. It's been a long time. But one of the staples in his office for years was this beautiful quilt made by, I believe, his sister of this deer, just perfectly serene, standing by a bit of water and drinking from it. And underneath it, it had Psalm 42, 1 as the verse. And that became a fixture in my imagination, specifically with Psalm 42. Also, I'm sure you guys, if you've been in the church for a while, have heard the song, As the Deer, right? And that peaceful image that it brings about this tranquility, this calm. And that's oftentimes what we think, right? This image of a deer, if you've seen that song or seen any artwork um, that depicts Psalm 42, that's what's portrayed, right? Am I right? Yeah. And yet, what looks to others as peaceful and serene can be in truth hiding inner pain and turmoil. And that's what we are going to be looking at today. So let's read Psalm 42 together. We'll go through the entire thing, and then we'll break it apart chunk by chunk afterwards. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep, and the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all the day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. That's a very peaceful, calming, reassuring psalm, isn't it? Yeah? Perfect for a quilt or a lilting melody. Not quite. One thing that we see here, and what we're going to be tracing throughout this, is that, especially in the Psalms, we see this theme that it's okay not to be okay, and specifically, how to deal with it. 
So let's trace that as we go through this psalm that looks at this inner turmoil and a profound sense of absence. Verse 1, as we are walking through it, we see, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Now, one of the things we notice about this first section is that there is a feeling of profound absence in these four verses, right? We notice first off that it's actually a song, right? That this was sung to God, and that's why it's part of our Bible, right? But in this absence, we see the deer panting, right? Not, not typically a peaceful thing if you actually stop and think about it. Now, a question that I want to ask is, why is this deer panting? It's one that we typically don't think to ask when we read this chapter. Why is this deer panting? Well, because it doesn't have water, right? Odds are the image here is that of a drought, a deer who needs sustenance, who needs water to hydrate it, to keep it alive, to keep it going. It's panting because of a lack. And the simile draws that deer panting, this image to, well, our souls panting for God. Now, again, why would our souls thirst for God? The same reason. There are times where we might not feel God's presence, where we feel this profound absence of the divine. And this is part of what this psalm is about. That we do not feel the presence of God as this deer needs the water that it doesn't have. So we need the God who sometimes seems a little bit far away from us. And I'm willing to bet each and every one of us in this room has felt that at some point or another. And if you haven't, I'm sorry to say, you will at some point. So it continues on. The psalmist, this is written by the sons of Korah, one of the tribes of um, the keepers of the temple in ancient Israel. The writer says, My soul thirsts for God, carrying on this imagery. And then he repeats the phrase, For the living God, getting a little bit more detailed here, right? Thirst for God, Not not just any God. Not a God who is absent, but a God who is alive. Then he asks another question, saying, when can I go and meet with God? Another way to say that is, when can I be before the face of God? When can I be in God's presence again? We see this progression, soul thirsting for God, for the living God, the God who we want to be in their presence of. And you have the question, when can I go? We might feel an absence, and we might wonder, well, how long will this take? When will we feel God's presence again? And then he continues on with uh, some pretty vivid imagery, right? He says, my tears have been my food. Day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? And there's not really an answer to this question that the writer responds with. As these these enemies of him are crying out, hey, where is your God? Why isn't he helping you? Their question's met with silence because, well, again, the psalmist doesn't know where God is. He doesn't feel his presence. He thirsts, he longs, he is aching for more God in his life. So much so that his tears have become his food. 
Now, this isn't talking literally, right? Because if you were trying to eat your tears, first off, it would probably be better to drink them, right? Uh, Just to think about it. But also, that wouldn't sustain you for very long, right? And yet, it provides a powerful, potent imagery. That in the midst of the grieving, all you can do is find sustenance in your grief. That's what this writer is feeling. Another thing is, in order to eat tears day and night, you have to have quite a bit of them, right? Is the mood down enough at this point? Let's change it around a little bit. Because he continues on after all of this, right? Talking about longing for God, a God who he does not feel the presence of. Talking about wondering when he will finally be before the face of God once again about these people who are mocking him and mocking his God, asking, where is he? He says in verse 4, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. Well, what things? How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. You see, as he is pouring out his soul, as he is feasting on his own tears, as he is panting for the God who he feels a lack of, this profound absence, what does he do in response to that? Well, he remembers. Specifically, he remembers church. Now, back then, they didn't have church the way we think about it, right? Uh, It was typically they go to the temple to worship God, um, Oftentimes, they would make a pilgrimage approximately three times a year to go there in order to see God, or at least to worship him amongst others. And in that, there would be sacrifices meant to appease sins. There would be praise and joy and songs. There would be festivals. Literally, people would just throw feasts there as well, right? Like a harvest dinner, right? There would be happiness and joy as they are worshiping the God who delivered them out of oppression from others, who delivered them out of slavery, delivered them out of pain and turmoil, out of wandering. And so as this writer is suffering, what does he do? He thinks back to times where he can remember God's presence. And while God is certainly the focus of worship, notice what he mentions more in that verse. He says he used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Part of the focus of this verse, yes, he is going to the house of God. Yes, he is praising God and he is under the protection of God, but what is he doing there? He's singing with others. He's fellowshipping with others. It's not him alone. There are others there who can remind him who God is, what he has done. So he goes there in the midst of the mockery, in the midst of the questions, in the midst of the pain and the absence that he is feeling. And he remembers a time when it was not that way. At a church I went to while I was in college, the pastor gave a little bit of advice that I think applies to this. He said, make friends before you need them. Because in order to follow the pattern of this writer who's going through this inner turmoil, in order to remember happy times with God, you kind of need to make connections, right? When you're going through these hard times, you need a friend to be with you. You need a mentor. You need someone you can turn to. So one of the big things that I want to challenge you guys is go to church. Which, by the way, good job. You're all here today, right? Go to church. But not just go. Not just attend. But make connections. There's a habit in the American church today, and I, I'm sure it's been a habit for a lot longer. Um, Loisy could probably tell me more, right, about the olden days. Uh, but there's a habit that I've seen a lot. Sorry about that. Um, 
that I've seen a lot <laughs> of people being what we call pew sitters. Yeah, they go to church, right? And yet, they come, they sit down, you don't even get the delicious snacks, which blows my mind. Um, they don't really talk to anyone. If someone comes up to them, they, they'll say a polite greeting, and then when church is over, they'll get up and leave. Yes, they heard a sermon. Yes, they participated in worship. But did they really make a connection? No. Part of, part of this response is remembering a connection that you have made. So don't just go to church. Yes, go to church. Keep coming. It's great. But make a connection. Because part of what makes church great, guys, is the people who you can fellowship with, the people who you worship God with. One thing I like to say is, um, especially if people say, well, I don't really feel like I'm getting much out of church, is, well, who could you be helping at church that you're not because you're not making connections, right? Church isn't all about getting fed. It's also about reaching out to others and helping feed them. So as we read this, the inner turmoil and the response being to remember God's goodness and to remember the fellowship that we have. It's important to have a fellowship that we can remember, right? So that's one of the challenges. Remember God in the times that he has been present, but also make a connection with the people here. Or if you're visiting, the people from where you typically go. So we continue on. Seeing this profound absence, we see another change of perspective. Verse 5, a refrain used twice in this psalm and once actually in the next psalm. Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 are uh, typically thought to have been one original work uh, split into two a long time ago. And it says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. In the midst of the doubts and questions, in the midst of the absence, God is still there. We might not feel him, but we know he is present. One writer said that doubt and faith are twins. When you have one, the other is bound to follow, right? Right? And doing it right, when you have your doubts, you should use that to seek more of God, right? The psalmist has a confidence in here. He asks, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Talking to his inner self. What's wrong? What's going on? Why, why are you struggling so much? To his soul, he says, put your hope in God. In the midst of the doubts, turn to him. Because the internet's not going to assuage your doubts, just to be honest, right? Turn to him. Turn to his word. And then he says this incredible line, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Another way to say that is for I will again praise him. That in the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of the absence, in the midst of not feeling like he can praise God, right? He says, put your hope in God. Because you know what? There will come a time where it will get better. Because if things are seeming bad, guess what? It'll turn around. Might not feel that way right away. Might feel like it gets worse right away. But put your hope in God, because there will come a time where you can yet again praise him. This confidence, it, it blows me away. And on top of that, he ends saying, my Savior and my God. This is the first time in this psalm that he takes ownership of his relationship with God, right? Right? He talks about his soul thirst for God, for the living God. 
And he wants to be in the presence of God, right? But it's not his God in verse 2. People ask him in verse 3, where is your God? But he doesn't respond. In verse 4, we see he used to go to the house of God. But in verse 5, we see him taking ownership of that. Saying, you know what? This God that I follow, he's my God. Not my parents' God, not my church's God. He is my God. Hopefully also your church is God, right? Um, but taking ownership is so important in that. So I want to ask a question. Is he your God? Do you follow him? Have you made that commitment? Do you take ownership of your faith, of your walk with him? Because part of the process of dealing with the inner turmoil is to know that he, your God, will be there for you always. And that he, your God, will make it better one day. And again, that one day might not even be on earth. But if he's your God, there will definitely be a better day. Right? So he continues on. As we see, again, it's okay not to be okay and how to deal with it, that we can remember him, that we can connect with others, and that we can take ownership of our relationship with him. But verse 6 continues. After verse 5 asks the question, why, my soul, are you downcast? Verse 6 says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, and all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By, they, by day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. He starts this next section, stating a fact, right? He asks, why is my soul downcast? And then he says the very next verse in verse 6, well, yeah, my soul is downcast, right? This admittance of, I'm not okay. Things aren't going very well. My soul is downcast within me. And then we see a great word, therefore, which as we know in the Bible, whenever you come across a therefore, a good question to ask is, what's it there for, right? Because it always takes something in the past and points to something in the future or points to a further development. So when your soul is downcast within you, what does the psalmist do? Therefore, he remembers God as we already talked about, remembering the praise and the worship and the connections you've made with others in praising the God who they worship together. This time, he remembers God from the land of the Jordan to the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, and we all know that, right? In a way, the land, Mount Hermon, um, and probably Mount Mazar, we actually don't know where that mountain is, were in the upper lands of Israel, both in terms of geography being north, but also in terms of elevation, being the mountainous regions. That's right around where the Sea of Galilee is filled up. You know, the sea where Jesus does most of his ministry. And then it talks about Jordan, which the Sea of Galilee has a river flowing out of it, down elevation called the Jordan River. And where the Jordan ends is well, one of the lowest spots on earth, uh, the Dead Sea, Right? And that land of the Jordan is top, typically talking about the southern area of the Jordan River. In a way, it's talking about from the north to the south of the land that God gave his people. We will remember what he has done. We'll remember how God brought us, speaking him, being an Israelite, brought them into the land, gave them it as a promise, helped them thrive, and then when they disobeyed, um, gave them consequences until he could help them thrive again. Remembering the fulfillments of the promises that he made to Abraham, that this land would be theirs, that he made to Isaac and to the people wandering in the wilderness. And remembering God's goodness as he developed them as a people and established them with his own covenant. So he remembers the land God gave them and the development of that. 
And then he goes to what I've always thought about as another really cool, peaceful imagery, as deep cries out to deep, right? But no, that's anything but peaceful once again. As deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. This brings to mind the images of Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. Where Jonah, you know, being the disobedient prophet, God said, Hey, you know what? You're telling people about God. I don't need to tell Nineveh, you know, your arch enemies who do horrible things. I need you to go and tell them about God. And Jonah's like, No, I'd rather they just go to hell. Right? So he disobeys God. He runs away from God, which, again, brilliant idea, right? And God decides to catch him. Pretty simply, right? Say, nope, you're not there. You're going here where I told you to go originally. And in that, he sends a storm. The boat that he was escaping all the way across the world from is caught up in that storm. They throw luggage overseas, and finally, uh, they decide, you know what? We need to throw this freeloader into the ocean as well. So they throw Jonah into the sea. He sinks down, and he's crying out as the waves billow over him, as he's been hurled into the depths to the very heart of the sea. He says, I have been banished from your sight. And in the middle of that, God provides a fish to come, pick him up, take him over all the way to the land of Assyria, of which Nineveh, where he was called, was the capital. Tell him, oh yeah, we'll go and continue walking from here. So this is not a peaceful imagery. Jonah at this time thinks that he is going to die. He's been thrown into the sea, this image of chaos in the ancient world, in the middle of a great storm, and swallowed by a great fish. Although people will ask, well, how could he have survived in a fish for three days? I mean, God does miracles, right? (laughs) I don't think it's too hard to ask him to make someone survive in a fish when he can raise himself from the dead. That's kind of a little bit of perspective we need to have, right? So Jonah's prayer to God in the middle of this fish after being tossed into the sea, he cries out, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry You hurled me into the depths. Interestingly, God, he said, hurled him into the depths, not the other sailors. Into the very heart of the sea. And the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said I have been banished from your sight. Yeah, I will again look toward your holy temple. Very similar imagery here, right? Deep calling to deep. Him being taken over by God's waterfalls. All God's waves and breakers sweep over him in Psalm 42, verse 7. And just like Jonah says, I will again look at your temple, the writer of this psalm says, I will again praise you. Right? These echoes calling out. And one of the things that blows my mind about this is he says, you know what? These are your waves, God. They're your waterfalls. This pain that I am feeling, somehow God's in control of it. And that can be an intimidating thought, right? Attributing the hard things that we are dealing with to God. But he says, they're they're your billows. They're your waterfalls. They're your waves. So we see this, that God is sovereign in our suffering. And we could say, well, why is God letting this happen? To be fair, if I'm going through a hard time, I'd rather be in the hands of God than the hands of some random chaotic whatever's going on. It doesn't have to be a scary thought. It can be comforting. That these breakers and waves, they feel like they could drown us, and yet God has them in our hands, in his hands. That this turmoil that we are feeling that could take us down into the depths, God's got it. We will again praise him. The fact that God has a hand in this. That God, I think with Job is saying, or similar to with Job is saying, 
you know what? Bad things might happen, but I'm still in control. I've still got this. Things will go well in the end. That's what he's talking about. He takes comfort in it. While also complaining to God, right? Saying, God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen to me? By the way, I think, because it's in not only Psalm 42, but a third of the other Psalms, right, is an okay thing to say. And he ends this section saying, by day the Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. in the midst of his complaints, in the midst of his suffering. As is his habit in this psalm, he cries out to God, and then he says, I will again praise you. He cries out, my soul is in distress, and he says, but you direct your love to me day and night. And this word love, in other translations, is translated loving kindness or mercies. It is a deep love of promise, One person said that this love is a loyal love, right? That it's not just some fleeting puppy love that we might um, feel on occasion, right? It's not teenage uh, relationships, junior high relationships. It is a loyal love that sticks with you. No matter what you have done, it is there. God's love in the midst of your hard times is always there. It is always present. It is always for you. So he says, by day the Lord directs his love. And at night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. Again, this ownership that we see, the God of his life. A song to God that is a prayer to him at night and God's love in the day. This presence that you may feel absent in the moment is still there, maybe under the surface. But he has you in his hand, and he loves you and cares for you. So one of the things from this, guys, is we see both God's punishment and his love. The breakers and the waves, well, they're not too big for him. And yet his love is there for us throughout it all. And one thing I want to encourage, like like this writer has done, is to recognize God's presence. To recognize that in the waves, he is there. In the day, he is there. In the night, he is there. That we might not feel it, but he is with us. And finally, we'll move on to the last section, verses 9 through 11. He says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all the day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He changes his tune yet again. Crying out to God once more. He says to God, his rock. Which is an interesting note there, right? Not only is it his God, but God is his rock, his foundation. I'm talking about God as rock. He says, why have you forgotten me? What I find interesting is, what are these people crying out to him, like his enemies? What are they saying to him? He says, where is your God? The writer's enemies, their foes, those who are causing this turmoil are saying, you know what, God isn't there with you. It seems for a moment that the writer's starting to believe them. God, why have you forgotten me? I remember the good days, but why have you forgotten me now? Right? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? And we see here what the nature of his turmoil is, right? It is those who are 
taunting him, who are oppressing him, people in his life causing this turmoil, which might be a lot of our turmoil too, right? He says that he is oppressed, that his bones suffer mortal agony as his foes taunt him, saying again, where is your God? He's feeling tempted in the midst of knowing who God is to think that God has abandoned him. And yet we see this is all the more reason to remember, right? In the midst of all this, he closes out the psalm saying, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. In the midst of all this, he again remembers God. He remembers that, you know what, things will get better, that there will be a time where he will praise God again, that he will join in the throngs in the community that he has built, praising him, that he'll remember all the good times that God has brought to him and his people. And one note that I forgot to say earlier in this refrain, it says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior. Because, yeah, God isn't just one who loves. He isn't just one who is present even when we don't feel it. He is also the God who saves. He is the one who has the power to take you out of the pit, to bring you out of the waves, to set you back on dry land, to quench your thirst, to bring hope when it feels like there is none, our Savior and our God. That's all the more reason to remember him. As we close, I want to make a note, no illustration, no nothing like that, but just some real talk here. We're heading into a rough time for a lot of people, right? The holiday season. Thanksgiving, for some, can be one of the hardest holidays of the year. Same with Christmas. As we get less sunlight, less daytime, Start to get dark at five now, guys. Be prepared. A lot of times we can suffer from depression. Whether it be ongoing, whether it be brought out by an event, like the loss of a loved one, who you would usually celebrate these holidays with, or whether it be seasonal affectivity disorder, which, by the way, has the most appropriate acronym, right? SAD. Um, as we're going into this time, I can't think of a better psalm to lean on. That in the darkness ahead, in the pain that we might be feeling, when we are thirsting for God, He is there. So remember, as we've talked about, it's okay not to be okay. But how do we deal with it? We remember God in the times that we had celebrating in his presence with others. We connect with others at church in his presence. We take ownership of our relationship with him, calling him our God. We recognize his presence in the hard time. And we have confidence when the, that when things are looking down, he can bring him back up again. So let's close as we pray, or let's pray as we close. And as we pray, I'm going to invite uh, Nate to come up and lead us in communion and offering, and Amy to come up and lead us in a closing song. God, thank you so much for this time that you have given us to gather together, uh, to hear from your word. Lord, even when things look peaceful, we know that there could be suffering underneath. 
So we pray over all of this that you will be comforting us, that you will be guiding us, that you will be reminding us who you are. Lord, and that you'll help us to connect with others. Quench our thirsts for you. In your name, amen.